Welcome to session eight of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering School. Today is March 12th, the final day of winter quarter for this class. My name is Burton Lee, I'm the course instructor. Welcome to you all. Today we're featuring a very unusual, interesting session on Kosovo, Albania, and Germany. Uh, special and unusual because this is our first startup out of Kosovo, Albania. We're going to be hearing about the Albanian diaspora, the emerging Albanian community uh, in Europe, coming out of the heart of the Balkans. And also uh, one of leading Germany's leading startups, not from Berlin, it's our first Munich-based startup, uh, also a spin out from the Technical University of Munich. So uh, it's an interesting contrast between two of Europe's richest and poorest regions and a great example of what entrepreneurs are doing to transform their economies and cultures and societies in their respective regions. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the eighth session of year nine of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, our speakers today are Pierre Gourdin, who is CEO USA uh, of Flixbus, formerly head of Flixbus France, was in charge of expanding Flixbus into France uh, over two years. And our second speaker, who will actually be presenting first, is Mirgam Kahani, who is founder and CEO of uh, Girafa, based in Kosovo, but also with ties and teams in Albania, as our first Kosovar Albanian speaker and startup as well. So now we're going to shift to Munich and Bavaria. Uh, an interesting contrast. Flixbus is a very big player in Europe. Um, they're not another Berlin startup. They came out of Munich. Uh, and what I found particularly exciting, and the reason I invited Flixbus to speak here at Stanford is because they're an example of a top European German startup entering the US marketplace and helping the United States to revitalize, rethink, reorganize its ground transportation infrastructure. That's a great story. So Pierre, thank you for thank you. coming. Uh, this is the forward button here, and let's give a welcome to Pierre Gourdin. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for, for having me here, and thanks for your presentation. And I mean, I, I guess I should thank your grandfather for what he did to, for my country. Uh, so I'm French, I'm not German, I'm not from Bavaria. But I guess uh, Flixbus today feels more like a European company than like a Bavarian company. And in a way, I guess in a couple of years, we'll feel like a global company. So just a quick question before. Uh, who has traveled with the Flixbus in this room? Well, so you, you can see it on the camera, but about 90% of the people raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's quite impressive, actually. And I, I, I wouldn't expect that many. Um, I'm going to start with the vision, which is very simple. And behind the vision, just a little part about the economics behind what we do. And then I'm going to go about the more boring part about how to execute on that vision. And I, I, I finish by telling a few words about our vision for the US, uh, long haul city to city market. And of course, uh, the next steps and the next things we have in store for the, to disrupt the long haul city to city mobility market. The, um, I, I think one thing that um, touched me in what both of you said is that there are so many things we take for granted. And I've been living here in this tech bubble for a year now. And, and it's, it can start with uh, having food on your table, having a, living in a home, having power, having Wi-Fi. Um, we take granted that if we want to watch something to access to culture, we can access to culture for free especially for our generation today, there are so many things that we can just access like that. Yet, not everything and not everyone can access to, uh, or to services. And we believe that there is actually one service that, that is kind of uh, in the back, that's where we've been a little bit backward in making it accessible to everyone, and that's travel. Uh, in, I, I started my career, I, was in, I worked in government, I was an advisor to the French Minister of Transport. I, I've always loved traveling, my mother comes from uh, Greece, my father's French, so they met in a plane, I guess. That's, I mean, I, I wasn't conceived in the plane, but it's, <laughs> it's kind of, uh, I, I guess it kind of uh, sends you on a track to, to work in, the, in this industry. And basically, 
we, we believe that everyone should be able to travel. My, my mom, when she moved to, to France, where she ended up uh, meeting my, my father, she was a political refugee. So she, for, she came from Greece for seven years. She couldn't travel back. And my grandfather was basically just uh, trying to raise his family away from home. Today, I can travel to Greece without a passport. There are no more borders in Europe. I hope soon there won't be any border. I mean, I've crossed the border with Albania from Greece a couple of times, and I hope soon that border we, we can uh, do away with and have some green buses as well in the area. The um, Flixbus is basically making transport available to everyone. So it's, you, you do that by making it cheaper, and you do that by making it simpler. And the easiest way to, to travel and the most used transport mean in the world today is actually bus. The thing is, it's also the most fragmented market on Earth. There are thousands and thousands of bus companies. There are thousands of bus operators. And it's very hard today if you say, I'm going to travel in Europe. I mean, 10 years ago, it was very hard to find the brand that was going to transport you. You would have to go to the station, buy your tickets. It, it was just too complex. And you are educated. And imagine if some of you, you would maybe try to, you, to visit your family, and you are maybe, say, from Algeria, Algeria, and you don't speak any European language, and you want to travel in Europe to meet your cousins in Dusseldorf, then it's even more complicated. So uh, I remember this data from my time in government that about uh, less than 50, close to 50% of the people in, uh, in France actually were almost never traveling. And it's, we are speaking uh, less than once a year traveling long distance. And um, the market opened, a bus became a thing. We, we tried to do our best for it. And I'm just going to explain you how we did that. And basically, it's a very fragmented supply. And it's a very, uh, and it's a very big demand. And we just sit at the intersection of those two things. So you could argue that Uber did to the car or to the rideshare industry what we did to the bus. It's basically, we don't own any of the assets. The buses are owned by independent uh, bus uh, companies, like they're in every city in Europe or in the US. Those buses, those companies buy the buses, put them on the Flixbus crawlers, so all buses are green, maybe, I mean, for the ones who, who did it, you know. And, um, and then they start driving, and we take care of everything else. So if you're a bus company, it's very easy. You just have to do what you, do, what you know to do best, buy a bus, start driving. And we take care of basically doing the planning, which is quite complex, a lot of data involved, doing the pricing, which can be quite aggressive, doing the marketing, putting the name out there, taking care of the brand, but also all those tiring stuff like customer service, lost and found, and when you, you go up in volume, it becomes more and more complicated. It's a, I, I drove by the, a McDonald's in, uh, in LA the other day, and they, they, they advertised 500 million uh, burgers were sold at this place. It was the second McDonald's that opened in the US. Still the arch is like in the movie. And that's what we aim to be to our partners. We are basically offering them a huge way to grow through this amazing single brand. The economics behind it are actually probably more efficient than our, comp uh, that, than our competition. So even if we don't, I mean, we are actually quite good at what we do, but in a way, if the day you take away the, produ the production of the service, and you just focus on one thing and another company will focus on one thing, your total cost of operation and your, basically your cost of goods sold is going to be lower. This makes us very competitive. And we, in theory, a company with, thir with, with such a model, and we see it in some other markets, should very quickly go to a, to a very dominant uh, position in, in markets. And that's what we tried to, to show. So very quick for those who, the few people of you who haven't traveled with Flixbus, today it's basically a household brand in Europe. Uh, all the buses are the same. If you are in Albania or if you are in Paris or in Amsterdam, you have restroom on board, Wi-Fi, water, power outlets, and a lot of space for your legs. It's, um, it's, today it's the first bus brand in, uh, in Europe and probably the first bus brand uh, globally. Uh, this was built in five years. We have more than 1,700 buses driving on European roads in 28 countries. To give you an idea in terms of the complexity of managing such a fleet, American Airlines, which is the biggest airline on Earth, is managing about a little bit less than 1,000 planes. So it's, and, and they don't have traffic. They don't have incidents on the road. I mean, it's, it's quite complex to manage. And we hold all this together 
from our eight offices now. Uh, I started the office in Paris. At the time, there was no office outside of uh, Munich. So it was kind of a, a little bit like reinventing the wheel and just seeing if the thing might work in another country, but more on that, more on that later. Uh, Flixbus is about 1,100 employees. Uh, when, when I say earlier that we do other things, we actually literally do them. So a lot of the customer service is done in-house because that's how you do the best customer service. And if you are really passionate and if you love your customers, and if you think that even if they paid $10 for the, for the service they bought, and they already get a very good deal, you still want to serve them. And you still want their experience to be amazing, the whole travel. We do the, the lost and found. We operate our own shops in, in tens of cities in Europe. We, we have to take care of a lot of the operational part with our partners. So you have about 1,100 employees. Of course, there are a lot of tech employees as well. And then um, those buses are driven by about probably by now north of seven or 8,000 drivers. So if, you, if we would be one company, it would actually be quite a big company. We've, yeah, you saw the number. And now we opened our new office in LA to try to replicate that in the US. The Flixbus, how, how did we get there? I think that two things that uh, sum up our approach and how we execute on things is one, we are, I mean, besides being very passionate, I, I hope you, I can transmit that even with the, with the accent, is that one, we are extremely competitive. We are probably one of the most competitive companies out there. And two, we are super quantitative. The competitive part, it started, everything started in Germany. The market opens up about uh, five years ago. So that's just five years ago, 2012. And suddenly, before you couldn't operate bus lines, and suddenly the market opens. And then you have all those companies that enter the market. And it's a little bit like when uh, mobile phones became a thing, and suddenly you had all those companies fighting for market share. With one difference is that there is no barrier to entry at all. Anyone can buy a bus. Anyone can uh, just start operating. And some of the companies that were entering the market at the time were actually quite big. You had Deutsche Bahn, which is a 30 billion plus euro uh, revenue concern, which said, OK, this is Germany. We're going to own this market. We're just going to buy some buses, put the name out. We're going to burn tens of millions. We're going to burn more than Uber, more than anyone out there, because that's Germany. And we own the place. We own the strongest brand. And we're going to take everything. You had a couple of, of, of companies like that. You had, of course, a lot of other startups who are also fighting with us. And how we uh, basically approached it is by being just trying to be, to be the best at everything we do. So it means being very aggressive on pricing, building very strong relationships with the best companies out there, because those guys, they need to believe that uh, we are going to make it. And it's, believe me, when you come in with a like, slide like that, and you are going to a guy sitting in the yard, and you are saying, OK, so you've never heard of us. In two years or three years, we're going to be the number one in your market. And all you need to do is invest about a million to $3 million to buy buses, then hire about eight people, and just start driving on this road, and people will be there. It's kind of a, of a stretch. And uh, bringing them over takes a, lead, a lot of legwork. And I think, in the end, it's also those partners that helped us win, because they, are, they have the best contacts on the ground. And, and Flixbus functions a little bit like a corp. Uh, even now that we are very big, all the partners, we are still at eye level. Um, I mean, I, I, I started the business in France, and there are tens of partners. We still speak regularly. Uh, when they call, you know, it's like family. They are, they are, they are our friends, and we, we are their green soldiers. They know that we are going to leave, leave everything on the table for them. It's not a vertical relationship. It is a transactional relationship, but it's very, it's very eye to eye, the relationship we have with our partners. And I think that's our main strength. Basically, Flixbus and its partners, we can only win together and we can only lose together. There is no uh, middle way where we win and the partners lose. And that's probably one difference, I mean, among many others, with some other platform companies out there, like, I mean, I'm not going to name any of them because I mean, you, are, you are all users. But I think it's one thing where we are a little bit different. And maybe that's also why it didn't grow that quick, although we, we, we didn't do so bad. Flixbus launches in Germany in 2015. Eh, uh, very early 2015, it actually makes an alliance with another company called Mein Fernbus. It was uh, quite of a watershed moment for the German market because those two companies were actually at war with each other in a big way. Think Uber and Lyft, think uh, Amazon and Walmart. Uh, German uh, travelers had it really good because you, 
you had tens of thousands of one dollar tickets. Uh, I mean, everyone could, you could travel for free basically for one year with those two companies because we are just trying to put more buses on the road, gain market share, uh, push the competitor out. And the day, one day everyone wakes up and they see those two companies getting together. They kept the name Flixbus. The other company's name was Mein Fernbus. You imagine, maybe they start to think, maybe we launch in other countries. Mein Fernbus works a little bit less well. But they kept the green. The green was actually the color of the other company. And we kept this very uh, strong take no prisoner uh, approach to launch in France. When the market liberalized in France uh, early 2015, this was uh, another uh, crazy adventure. I'm going to tell you more a little bit later about it. Just I wanted to share those numbers. You know, uh, you see a lot of startups, I guess, and uh, I've seen a lot of decks in my time. And I see a lot of people, they come in and they're like, yeah, I have a, I have a great product. Uh, I think I'm better than the other guys. My market is a billion, and I'm, I'm going to go after 5% of that market, so this would give me 50 million of revenues, and it would make a great business. This is not how we look at things. We believe that if you get the best product, if you get the economics on your side, if your brand is stronger, and if you are really good and aggressive at what you do, you should get the whole market. So we, when we enter a market, we don't go for 10% or 15% or 20%. We go for the whole thing. We go for, basically, the, the vision is that there are no more buses on the road that are not green. If you are, so there are still a couple of companies out there. One of them is, uh, in France, is Webus, which is also state-owned. It's owned by, owned by SNCF. They, they're actually quite good at the service they do, but they've been, they lost about 100, more than $140 million dollars just to stay in the market with that market share. We, are, we actually have a lot of partners who are making money today. So we are more profitable than them. Our buses have more people, we have more stops. And slowly we are basically outstopping them, out servicing them, out branding them. And I hope by in two years, uh, Flixbus will be, will be much better. When I, when I left France about a year ago, we were already number one in the market. We we're probably a little bit 51, 52%. And uh, when I arrived in France, I was in my living room with this deck, same thing, just trying to find bus owners and no one would take, my, would take the call because everyone thought that uh, there's no way your German startup can make it in France because culture is so different and it is different. I mean, we, we've had uh, some issues with France and Germany in the past years and it was not like the easiest thing to sell to people that we, we are going to be number one. And I remember when we launched that line, which was the first line, and it was a guy who was actually based in Clermont-Ferrand, that's him there on the right, with the glasses, the guy with the tie is the bus driver on the line, and the guy on the right, this is one of the oldest companies uh, in, in this area. It's, it's a, it's a family-owned business, and they, they just saw this crazy French guy coming in with this vision and the backing of some other crazy uh, guys in Germany saying, now, just trust us, we're going we to fill your bus, and he actually went on bought that bus, started driving on that line, and since doing this, he has added a couple of buses, and he has made millions in the meantime. But when he launched, I mean, he, he thought there would be a lot of other bus companies launching at the same time. Actually, he was kind of the first, because we hadn't found that many. And then we just started adding them, and adding them, and adding them. And the, the result today looks more like that. So we launched uh, from France, uh, Spain. We launched uh, Belgium. This is about... Actually, there are not all the stops there, but you have, uh, I'd say, more than 200 stops in, in this area. So it's, uh, quite, it's, it's, uh, it's the most dense transport network in the area. Spain right now is still done internationally. There are some markets we are not allowed to enter because they are still in a monopoly situation. But this was built by a team of about, uh, today there are about 80 people in the French team, uh, but the, the core team of building up this was about 30 to 50 people in two years of very intense work. Uh, what I get asked a lot, and we, we don't get there. Um, actually, I'm gonna, let's, go, let's get there now. What I get asked a lot from people here is, why is there not uh, a company from the US who just raises $150 million and, uh, and, and does the same thing in the US? And I think that there are two answers to that. One, many people in the in the tech community in uh, the US. And it's, I don't say it in a disparaging way at all because it's, it's probably the right way to approach things. Uh, I really looking to solve not bigger problems, but problems that are maybe closer to them. So the fact that many people in the US can't afford to travel is maybe not such a, 
the first thing that comes to mind if you are in an area where, I mean, average salaries are very high, it's, uh, it, it seems more like understandable and uh, relatable to start something to deliver food at any time, amazing food, which I mean, I love, by the way, and, uh, or, or do some more local uh, business that cater to, to your people, basically. So uh, this might be an explanation. And the other explanation is that it's super hard. So it's, I mean, that's one thing I took away from your thing. It's, I mean, start, uh, starting a business in Europe, like starting a business in the US is really, really hard. And I think we, we picked, <laughs> it applies to you as well, and uh, to many other companies, but we picked one of the really, of the not the easiest ones. And that's probably why no one else is trying to do the same thing because it's, it's just such a pain. You have, and I, I love it, so, but I'm crazy as well. So basically you, you have to, to, to become passionate about this brand that in the end you are not maybe using that much, but you really have to love it and to believe in it. You have to, to build sales channels because many people, and this is one of our modes, those are all our, the things that protect us as a company that will make us win in the US. You have to build a network of thousands of local agencies, which is basically can be your local delivery, your local travel agency, that, are, that will sell your tickets for cash because many people still, even today, they can't buy online, they don't have a credit card or Apple Pay. You have to build a very strong tech platform. And here again, we do everything in-house. One of our co-founders is a tech, uh, is a former Microsoft guy, and he, he, knows, his, he knows his shit. Um, we have to build those relationships with meeting with thousands, literally, of bus companies all over the place and just trying to find the best of them and weeding out the bad ones and just building a strong relationship, convincing them that it's worth for them to basically play the farm on us, which is not an easy, an easy way. We have to build relationships with government on state level because you have to gain just authorization to open the line, but also on city level because those buses, they go to stop somewhere, right? So we have to find the stations. Uh, we have to basically try to put green on the, on the station. So when people come, it's not just on the app, they can find the station directly. We have to integrate ourselves. And this is one of the strengths of the planning team integrate ourselves in the, in the local transportation network. And finally, we have to use all those billions of data points and build uh, a crazy system where we are able to predict where people will want to go, where we are able to put the most people on the bus that we, that we can probably make it. In many markets, we actually manage to take, if you have a, market of, a bus market of X, we can multiply it by a factor of, of two or three, a little bit like what Uber is doing to the cab market. If it's so much easier to get a car, just more people are going to do it. If, if it becomes cheaper, even more people are going to do it and more people are going to drive somehow, even if they don't always find the, the interest in it. And we believe that, for instance, just to, very quickly on the US market, our current US market is about $2 billion. We believe that the total market value is about uh, three times that, so four, uh, six billion dollars. A big part of that is actually going to be just people who don't want to have to use their own cars anymore. And who, who owns a car here? Okay, so video, no one. Yeah. And um, basically, uh, probably uh, 20, years, 20 years ago, you would have had uh, maybe two or three times that people uh, raising their hands. Today, you don't need a car. There is no more use case for a car. And this is one of the reasons we start in California. I, last time I was in Palo Alto when we, when we had lunch, I drove by to my home in Neu Valley in San Francisco and it cost me $12.42 with Uber Pool Express. And it's cheaper than the Caltrain. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a very simple use case. You don't need a car anymore. But if you don't have a car, when you want to go to LA, well, well you go to Flixbus, you are not going to rent a car to drive. It's actually quite a long drive. So this is where we... This is one of the reasons we launched on the West Coast. This is one of the reasons we are super enthusiastic about the US market. Um, and also, we, we, we have the size now. We are probably by now, I mean, there are a couple of other big bus brands out there. You, many of, of you might have heard of Greyhound or Megabus. Uh, today, Flixbus is actually the biggest uh, bus brand out there. There is no, and this is, we use a lot of Google search. I mean, we just measure, it's easier to measure than what just asking people. And uh, we see that Google, uh, Flixbus is actually the first brand out there. We are also a very uh, loved uh, brand. We have an amazing rate of recommendation. If you go on Instagram, you, you, you check the, you follow the Flixbus hashtag. 
You see people who reunite, re reunite with their loved ones, who, who go to cities for interviews that might change their lives. You see people who move to new places to start a new study course. And you see people who are basically just seeing the sea for the first time or, seen, or going on the Eiffel Tower. And it's been their dream forever. And we basically empower all those dreams. And uh, in a way, today we are as much as a, how, uh, as much as a lifestyle brand as a transport brand. <laughs> and I think in the end, this will be always our biggest mode if someone wants to copy us, is that you need to find that secret source of mixing all those things together and then executing uh, very strongly. Uh, there are three things we are looking at right now. US is one of them. Actually, there are two other things, and I just wa wanted to finish on that. Because you are probably asking, okay, you build this huge brand, what now? I mean, bus brand is really nice. You can take the whole world, put it green. And are there other things that you are looking at? Actually, there are three things. One is the US, very big, uh, then other countries like outside of Europe. Two, we are starting a little bit in the charter business, which is actually even bigger as an opportunity because we start to get calls. People ask us, hey, how can I rent a bus? Uh, man, we don't own a bus, that's not what we do. And then they are saying, yeah, but I, I see your buses every day, so you, I can probably just rent one for the weekend because I'm getting married and I, I don't know who else to call because there are so many bus companies out there and you seem to be the biggest. And then we start just sending those leads to our partners. And then we're like, we get all those calls, we don't like that. We want to make it more simple. So we, we build a site and then we build a pricing tool. And then today, if you want to rent a bus in Europe, you just go on our site. Where do you start? How many people are you from one to a thousand or two thousand, uh, may, how many stops do you want to take, what are the days you want to leave and the days you want to arrive. You get a quote, you book it and you are done, bam. Your next um, study trip in, in Europe to Berlin or maybe to Munich to check on the, um, on the Oktoberfest um, is, is basically taken care of and you, you, get, you are sure to get the best quote. And this is another billion dollar market so we are starting to invest into this and we are already market leader in that part, but it's not key, but it's actually quite promising. And then we are also uh, looking at other means of transportation, because if it works with bus, why couldn't it work with other means of transportation? So the, the first thing we thought of was, of course, a uh, train, because in Europe, people still travel a lot by train. So last week, we launched our first train service. Uh, uh, there are actually two lines in two cities in Germany. And it's extremely, it's going extremely well. In many ways, a train is just like a big bus. And we know how to sell those seats and we know how to, put the, how to put the name out and we know how to make your experience as a traveler amazing. And we just applied to a new mean of transportation. Then it's about finding someone who's gonna buy a train, but we found people who bought buses, so maybe. And we actually managed to find someone who bought the train who's actually very happy about uh, the deal he made. And, uh, uh, we don't, I mean, there are other things we're looking at, but this is right now the, the other big mean of transportation. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, sorry for my French accent. And uh, yeah, looking forward to your questions.